everyone, I'm Georgia and this is The Sound of Georgia and today is the second episode of the Von Traps and the Sound of Fictionalization series that I'm doing. So today we're going to try and answer the question posed very early on in The Sound of Music. How do you solve a problem like Maria? We're going to be looking at Maria across all the adaptations but as I said in my last video I am going to go into a bit more detail than I did last time from here on in. So let's start with some backstory. Maria Kuchera was born on the 26th of January 1905 on a train going from Innsbruck to Vienna. Yes that's right she was born on a train. I'm sure I've said it before but if I haven't 99% of the stuff I know about Sound of Music I have heard so many times that I don't know where I first heard it. I can't remember that. But this one I do. This one I know exactly where I learned it and I will never forget it. When I was about seven I think a local theatre group did a production of Sound of Music. I auditioned for Gretel. I didn't get it, my friend got it, but I did go and see it. Up at my school's hall because it's one of the biggest auditorium theatres around here and I remember spending a lot of the night looking at the wall and wondering what that big wooden thing was. Spoilers, it was the pipes for the organ. Getting back on track I went to the show and we bought the program and there was a page in the program about the real Von Trapps and it said that Maria was born on a train. This was long before I started keeping a mental encyclopedia of Sound of Music facts in my brain so I will never forget that that's where I learned it. But then I also read the program and thought Georg's name was George which I guess I mean it's the German form of George but no but I was seven. Anyway Maria was born on a train. By the time she was three her mother died and by the time she was nine her father had died and so she lived with her uncle Franz and she was actually raised an atheist and that's kind of important. Can't remember how old she was when this happened I think she was a teenager at least but she went to a chapel or a church or something like that thinking it was going to be a concert but instead she walked in on a sermon so she actually had one of those spiritual awakening moments or two actually in a sense. Flashing forward a bit she actually got a master's degree in education from the State Teachers College for Progressive Education in Vienna and that's actually part of the reason she was sent to the Von Trapps in the first place but the other was because life in the Abbey was taking a toll on her health. This is where her second sort of spiritual awakening moment comes in. She loved hiking and doing all the outdoorsy type things that you would imagine she would like from the adaptations. There was this one day where she was hiking with some friends and she looked out and she saw this glacier in the distance and the sun was shining on it. And she was so overwhelmed at the beauty of the world God had created for her that she thought there was only one thing to do. Lock herself up in a convent. So she ended up saying goodbye to her friends then and there and she headed off to Salzburg to join Nomberg Abbey. But that meant she went from hiking and spending a lot of time outdoors to not. Almost cold turkey and she ended up getting a lot of very bad headaches. So between that and the teacher's degree she was pretty much the perfect candidate to put a little Maria von Trapp. And that's where I'm going to leave the backstory for now because where we are in the timeline is where all the adaptations start. But I will just start with one final point and that is the memoir. When I was reading it I was actually surprised at how similar it was to Sound of Music. Yes you heard me, similar. There are obviously huge differences, I'm not going to deny that, but I think it's more complicated than people simply forgetting those similarities. I don't think it's just people forget the similarities, I think they want to forget the similarities because for all the differences Sound of Music and Maria's original memoir do have a lot of things in common but people like to forget that. They like to throw Rodgers and Hammerstein under the bus for historical inaccuracy. Like how perhaps Maria was not the kind-hearted angelic soul that all the adaptations make her seem which you'll have read if you've seen any of those things you didn't know about the Sound of Music lists because it's on all of them and Maria herself even agreed with that. All the adaptations play up how much of a problem she was at the Abbey including Maria herself. According to Tom Santo Pietro, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, when he was writing The Sound of Music story he said that members of the crew 
when they were making the film, went to the Abbey and asked about Maria and the nuns didn't even remember who she was. So was Maria herself playing up how much of a problem she was? Was she lying? Well, we'll put a pin in that. I'll come back to it. But back to the adaptations, every version makes it absolutely clear that she's not meant to be a nun. She's annoyed that she can't whistle and slide down the banisters, but that doesn't stop her in both the Trap Family Story anime and the Trap Family she does do exactly that. And of course Sound of Music mentions this as well. You know, when the nuns complain about Maria singing in the Abbey. By singing in the Abbey. Yeah I know, it's a musical. So they ship her off to the one traps. And it's more or less the same in every other version. It's like the final sentence in a blurb of a novel. She can help the family and along the way she can help herself. The biggest differences between the reality and the adaptations all of which I said are pretty much exactly the same, is the health. The fact that she was getting a lot of headaches is completely axed from any of the adaptations. Well in reality they were a vital factor in her leaving. So when she first arrives she meets the butler and honestly, strange as it sounds, that was actually more or less the case along the entire timeline. Confusing him with the captain seems like it would be a Hollywood trope or cliche as it is. And while Sound of Music is the only one where that specifically happens, in the other adaptations and in real life she just asks if he's the captain, but you get the picture. Once inside that's when she meets the captain. Sound of Music is the only one where he catches her doing something he doesn't like, but that makes sense because he's very different in Rogers and Hammerstein's version as opposed to any of the others. The anime and the German film are far closer to the truth where he is concerned. We will talk more about him in the next video. The anime is the only one where she's sent to the Von Trapps for the same purpose that she was sent there in reality, to be a tutor. She was sent to the Von Trapps in the first place to be a tutor for little Maria Von Trapp. Little Maria was rather sick and she couldn't go to school like the rest of her siblings, so she needed somebody to give her the lessons at home. So. So in the anime, after she's met all the other six children, Gail goes up and introduces her to little Maria. In Sound of Music and the German film, she's just the governess. She's the governess and she's there to look after all seven of them. As far as music and playtime, or lack thereof, were with the family, that was actually very much the case. According to her memoir, Maria says that one day Werner saw her guitar case and asked if she could play. She played something they didn't know and so she made them write out a list of all the songs they did know. And then the next day she started teaching them new ones. That's almost exactly what happens with the stage version of Sound of Music, with Brigida noticing the guitar and asking why she's brought it. What's in here? My guitar. What did you bring this for? For when we all sing together. We don't sing! Of course you sing! Then in the German film there's a scene where the youngest girl Martina runs into Maria's bedroom because it's all rainy and stormy outside. All the other children follow and they all start singing this very bouncy song to cheer themselves up. After that there's a scene where Maria pulls a long length of drapes out and the next thing you know all the children are tumbling around and rolling in the grass. And just as a reminder I was talking about the German film. The screenwriter Georg Hertelich actually gets a mention in the Sound of Music's opening credits. Whether it was for those ideas or something else, Sound of Music obviously uses those two ideas to the letter, like copy and paste them. Honestly the biggest difference between Maria along the timeline from both the reality to all the adaptations is her relationship with the captain. Or rather the biggest difference between Rogers and Hammerstein's version and everything else. Because love. Of course the one where they're butting heads at the beginning is the one where she's totally and completely in love with him when he asks her to marry him. And honestly that's the case with everything really. Yeah I know why Rogers and Hammerstein are thrown under the bus for historical inaccuracy more than any of the others. I get it. It's still unfair. There is one point in the German film that's a confrontation between Maria and Georg but it is far more civil and far more subdued than the screaming match you get in Sound of Music. According to Maria's memoir it seems that the children were rather instrumental in 
getting her and their father together. One day they asked her just out of the blue whether she liked their father. She of course said yes because she did like him. But by doing that in pretty much everyone's mind she'd accepted the proposal. In regards to just marrying him at all in real life she was very upset and angry. In the memoir she talks about how when she returned home from the Abbey because the nuns needed to know what was going on she ended up collapsing in his arms and just sobbed. In the Trap Family Georg's proposal comes right after Princess Yvonne has confronted Maria and let her know that Georg is indeed in love with her and if you're a bit confused we'll get to Princess Yvonne later. But long story short that was the precursor to the scene in the film version of Sound of Music where Elsa confronts Maria after the party. And that actually wasn't all that different from what happened in reality. When she's asked if she likes him, talking about the German film again, she says if I do I don't know it. And she says the same thing at the next scene in the Abbey but she's smiling so we know obviously she does. Just as a little aside I'm going to bring up one of my favourite moments in the 2013 live version. This one, this version is riddled with problems but there is one moment I absolutely love and it's right before Climb Every Mountain. Let's put aside the fact that Audra MacDonald, Audra MacDonald of all people, sounds like she's asking Carrie's Maria about her prom date there's this wonderful line that Carrie says that I haven't heard in any other version of The Sound of Music. She lists off a couple of things she really likes about the captain, pretty much saying she loves him without saying the word love. I like the kindness in his eyes. I like the way he speaks even when he's stern. I like the way he smiles at little Gretel. Back to the German film, we've got a lot of details here. The captain's right there when she opens the door and she tells him she has to marry him. The words are pretty much exactly what she says in the memoir but she's smiling and they kiss and the children cheer so love. And when I talk about the dialogue in the German film what I am going from is the English subtitles that you can find on the version you watch on YouTube because I don't speak German. So as far as the words they are actually speaking it might be a little bit different. The Sound of Music it's all about love with Rogers and Hammerstein. She runs away because she loves him and she doesn't know whether that's allowed. And as soon as the Reverend Mother tells her it's all good and loving him doesn't mean she's abandoning God she races back to the villa to find out what's up. He's engaged that's what's up and her heartbreak is evident especially in the movie. But then in the space of one scene the engagement between Georg and Elsa falls apart and he and Maria are alone to confess their love and get engaged all in the space of one song. And from there we cut straight to wedding bells. With the anime this whole situation is very much like the memoir. Being a TV series the anime can get away with a lot more and go into a lot more detail. Simply because it's a TV series with 40 20 minute episodes rather than 3 hours. The children are still scheming, she's still confused and when she goes to the Abbey and finds out there are other ways to serve God rather than being in a cloister it's all good. Honestly with the anime I'm not sure exactly when they're in love. I, th I think my favourite moment in the anime is where she says his name for the first time because that is something I have only ever seen in fanfic and it is a big deal. But in the anime by the time that happens they're already married so I don't know exactly when she's meant to have fallen in love with him in the anime. Her return is kind of like the memoir but it's different enough from I had wanted to know the will of God but now when I met it I refused to accept it. And so they said I have to marry you so we have some level of creative license. The wedding is the most similar moment across the board because the differences in the adaptations really don't have anything to do with the source material. How much variety can you really have in a wedding from the 1930s. It's really more of a butterfly slash Cinderella moment for Maria than anything else. And in every adaptation along with the memoir even. From here on out Maria is slightly different. The biggest difference with the wedding is what Maria herself actually says. Mostly because it seems to go against everything else we've already been taught is not the truth. In the memoir she says she had a heart full of happiness and was ready for this wholeheartedly and cheerfully. Going back to those things you didn't know about the Sound of Music lists, every single one of them points out how this was wrong. Something that lines up with her final memoir 
almost 20 years later. That one talks about how she screamed at the communion rail and tried to get the wedding postponed and things like that. In her original memoir it's phrased as being in relation to serving God but it's still very very different from what she wrote in her final memoir. Hindsight I guess. She wrote the first memoir right after her husband died but the final one was written 20 something years later so she could probably admit to herself that no I wasn't happy at the beginning. Now for a time jump to when they went bankrupt in the mid 1930s. Sound of Music cuts this out completely. In both reality and on screen Marie is the one that takes charge when they end up in financial distress. She's the one that pulls everything together after the banks folded and they've lost their fortune. The memoir states pretty clearly and briefly that they had to give up things like the car and let some of the staff go and move up to live only on the third floor of the house. In the German film she actually suggests selling the house and when Georg says no she moves on to taking in paying guests. So pretty much the same thing happens in the anime. She says it will all be good for them to do things for themselves. They turn the villa into a boarding house and live on the third floor only. The anime itself is just bizarre but in regards to Maria it's really interesting because she's clearly modelled after Julie but she's a far cry from Julie's Maria. So it almost feels like seeing Julie out of character. But talking about Julie in Sound of Music post-marriage Maria is almost non-existent. The only moment she really has after the honeymoon that isn't specifically escape related is the entire fictional conversation she has with her stepdaughter about love. The other thing with Sound of Music is her reactions to the escape are different depending on whether you're looking at the stage or the screen version. It's not uncommon knowledge that they didn't escape over the mountains. They boarded a train to Italy. And when Maria appeared on Julie Andrews's television show in the 1970s she talks about how they sang their way across Europe and eventually to New York. And then what conveniently skips all of this and it goes straight from we have to leave to oh look there's a Statue of Liberty. The German film also skips over the actual escape and they just land on Ellis Island which actually did happen. In reality it happened later it wasn't their first arrival in New York when they got held up there but it did happen. Obviously they're a singing group and so they have an agent and he turns up at Ellis Island but he proves to be completely useless until they start singing as he's leaving. They of course charm everybody there and with it win a concert deal and their freedom. Rogers and Hammerstein initially wanted to end the musical the same way on Ellis Island but by the final version obviously that was cut so we have even less of the escape to work with. But they've all sought refuge in the Abbey Maria says it's all going to be fine because once we're over the mountains we're in Switzerland. They most definitely would not have been in Switzerland. They would have been heading straight for Eagle's Nest which is about the worst place they could have gone. In the film it's pretty much the complete opposite. Not in that they would have been heading to Eagle's Nest but in the fact that she does all of that. In the movie Georg does. Regarding the escape Maria and the captain's roles are pretty pretty much flipped from stage to screen. With the anime the escape takes up the entire final episode and it follows the memoir more closely than anything else. It's the only one where we get to see more than the very beginning of the escape. The ruse they used to get out is completely false but we do see something and we've also discovered a couple episodes earlier that Maria is pregnant which actually was the case. It's the only adaptation to include that. After that we've got the voiceover telling them they went to Italy, another point in the reality's favour, and then the final scene is them pulling up in New York. Overall across the adaptations Maria's similarities far outweigh her differences and the adaptations line up more with her original memoir than people remember they do. Remember how I asked whether she lied at the very beginning? Well let's pull the pin out. I don't think the Maria we see in the memoir and therefore in all the adaptations is so much fictionalized as it is how Maria saw herself. After all it is a memoir it's not a biography. Did she exaggerate how much of a problem she was at the Abbey or was that simply how she remembers it? I think it's far more likely it's that second one. Maria as depicted in Memories Before and After the Sound of Music by the eldest daughter Agatha is far far more different from any of the other versions than Maria of her memoir is to any of the adaptations. So if the adaptations don't line up with 
everything you hear about her. I think it's because the memoir is more how she saw herself than point blank what she was like. Which is completely understandable. So that's everything for the first real episode of this series. I hope you enjoyed. Next week we'll be talking about Georg. Feel free to like and subscribe and I'll see you in my video next week. So long, farewell!